push and go live right now. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, good to see you all there. Uh, let me know if you can hear me. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. And also if you can hear me. Just takes a second for everyone to say hi. Are you there, Jesus? Yeah, can um, you hear me? I can hear you. Um, hey, hey, can you guys hear okay? Let's hear. Yeah. Hear you both. Awesome. People can hear us both. Fantastic. All right. And I take it you guys can see my desktop. <laughs> so, all right. Well, let's go um, and just let's kick this puppy off. I apologize about that. You guys should see me right now. Um, we had a couple of little problems there. Of course, it was my fault, but we're good now. Um, and uh, so, anyway, welcome. <laughs> this is going to be, uh, after a false start last week, uh, this is our first time bringing in a guest. So there was a couple of little things I had to learn about in OBS, which is why we had uh, you know, a couple, couple of false starts there, guys. But now everything is sorted and ready to go. This is how we do things. We move along at the speed of a um, frozen snowball anyway <laughs> welcome to uh, life from lockdown episode number 46 can you believe it we're at episode number 46 and this is where we go live every single thursday at 1 p.m pacific time and we're sponsored by nobody so we can do and say whatever we want you, you can is... you can let uh, the photoshop training channel sponsor you colin okay this week we're sponsored <laughs> by the photoshop training channel yeah. And um, they make pillows and yes. uh, t-shirts. Exactly. Um, that's what they do. And yeah. uh, and uh, you can see the pillow in the background there. You can order that from um, uh, from ptc.com. Actually, the Photoshop training channel, <laughs> check out his, who's, who's our guest this week. It's going to be a lot of fun. He's got some compositing tips uh, all set up for us. And um, yeah, so do us a couple of favors here. Number one, hit that like button. It helps us with the algorithm, lets people know that we're here and streaming. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. And of course, subscribe also to Photoshop Training Channel or the Photoshop Training Channel, which is to say Zeus's stuff. And Donald wants a PTC t-shirt, a PTC t-shirt. You, you know what, I've been, I've been wanting to make PTC uh PTC shirts, especially for when I go to events, I can give them out. But I have, I guess, there's no more live events now. Yeah, well, let's get. Um, why don't we get you and me on the screen? There we go. There's Jesus. You guys should be able to see him now. <laughs> so yeah, we've all been talking about shirts. We've been meaning to do some live from lockdown T-shirts, and right. at the rate that I'm doing this, these are going to be great vintage shirts. <laughs> <laughs> By the time they come out, uh, yeah. reminders of the good old days. Um, you guys should see us both now. Uh, okay, seeing you at the moment. Um, T-shirts. Hi from England. Hey, Dazzy, how's it going? Uh, good to see you, Russ, Tracy, David. There we go. Everybody's there. Rod Shelley, um, Gary Peterson in the house, uh, Cheryl John, Andrew Nichols. All the regulars are here. Good to see you guys. We'll do uh, good to see you, Photo Maker. And what we'll do, and hi from Scotland, Bonnie Scotland. Good to see you. So we'll <laughs> do our um, uh, Afterglow in a little bit at the end. Kiora, that's a good New Zealand. Uh, I hope you guys are doing well from the earthquake there, Paul, and uh, the other people from New Zealand. Did you guys feel that earthquake? That was a pretty decent one, 7.1, I believe, off the coast. Tsunami warnings, the whole thing. Um, so uh, I hope you guys are all safe and okay there. Um, so what we're going to do now is it looks like everybody's here. We're just going to jump in and I'm going to head this over to Jesus's desktop. <clears throat> is your desktop ready to go, Jesus? I'm ready to roll, man. Okay, so why don't we just kick over? I'm just going to hand it over to Jesus right now. Uh, Jesus Ramirez from the Photoshop Training Channel. Give him a nice round of applause. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colin. And thank you so much, everybody, for being here with us this morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where in the world you're watching from. As I said earlier in the chat, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Let us know where you're watching from. I see a lot of people from the UK, from England. Uh, Diane and, and Cheryl are both in the UK. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you're in the UK, it must be about 9 p.m. So thank you for spending your evening with us. And yeah, this stream is going to be all about compositing. Feel free to ask your questions. And Colin, also feel free to interrupt at any moment so I can answer any questions. Sounds and good. And there's no, <clears throat> excuse me, 
There's no particular order in the compositing tips that I'm going to show you. Most of these include um, a larger project that I'm not really going to create the project from scratch just because it would take too much time. And I just want to show you like a specific thing on how you would handle something. In some cases, I may actually go into the PSD and show you what the layers include and how they were created. Um, again, I'm not going to do it from scratch, but at least you'll have a basic understanding of how the files were created. And then I'll show you the, the tip that I'm talking about for that particular step. So, um, ooh, cool. We have, uh, it's one in the morning in Dubai. Dubai. Thank you so much for watching uh, Graphics Ali. Thank you very much. Friday morning in New Zealand, 10 a.m. Awesome. So yeah, so this is the first image that I'm gonna start with and this is the background. And I wanted to place this model into this background. And I've already removed the model, the background from the model by using the- Oh, remote... hang on, let me get you on the desktop. Sorry, my bad. Oh, no worries. <laughs> and I just wanna ask you just a quick question just before we um, kick off of the, uh, with the session here. Uh, did yeah. anybody come in from the newsletter? I just wanna make sure the newsletter subscribers got in here, okay. From email, yep, we're good. All right, back to you, Jesus. Cool, and now I, gotta re now I see where my, my screen is. That way I know where I could, you know, like if I cover, cover something with, um, you know, I just got to make sure that I don't cover, talk about something that's in the bottom left because I realize now that my. Yeah, don't worry, I got it. I will move you. I'll move you if you can. All right, yeah. cool, cool. So, yeah, um, so right now we're going to look at the layers panel. And like I was saying, we have this background and I want to composite this model in here. And I use the remove background feature that is new in. Uh, Photoshop, what, what Photoshop is it new in? Is it like Photoshop uh, 2021, I think is when it was first implemented. But anyway, there it is. Uh, remove background and we have this image. And obviously the edges are gonna be perfect. Um, I'm gonna show you a, a technique on how to fix hair later, but I fix her hair in this image by simply creating a new layer. And I'll, I'll briefly show you what I did. It, basically what I did is I just took pieces of her hair like so. And then I duplicated them by pressing Control J, Command J on the Mac, clipped it to the layer below by pressing Control Alt G on Windows, Command Option G on the Mac, and just moving it to the edge there. See that's here when you move it to the edge, it kind of makes it seem like the hair is still there. And obviously, you know, I distorted it and rotated the, the hair so it kind of matched the flow or the actual hair. So that's what I did on this layer here to, ma to, to make it fit, as you can see there. That way we didn't have those halos. I also had a brightness uh, layer created by a curves adjustment layer just to darken everything up. And I also desaturated the image so that it matched the background. And I applied a hue and saturation uh, layer by using the selective color adjustment layer and just selecting the reds because that's the color of her skin and just adjusting the sliders to make it match the background. Now, the tip that I'm trying to show you in this example is that when you have an image like this, um, if this were a real image, we would have rim light around our model. And in this case, we really can't actually, I mean, we could paint it in if we wanted to, you know, we can create a new uh, layer right above everything else. So let me open up this group, enable it, clip it to the layer below. And I could come in here and spend some time painting with white. Uh, and actually that's a, that's a horrible brush to use. So I need to use a brush with a hardness of zero. And I could just come in here and, and try to paint it in, you know, and e even something like that, it's already making it look more realistic. But unfortunately, you're going to make it really difficult on yourself. This is passable. If this is, you know, all, all you have, this is better than nothing. But I actually think that it's actually better to composite in a highlight from a different image because I think that'll give you better results. So, for example, I have this photo here. We have this lady's arm. See that? See how we have her arm here? And I can come in and I can just take the highlight from this arm and use it in my composite. So I'm going to copy it and I can bring it back in, paste it here, uh, control T on Windows, command T to transform. And I can just place it as best as I can over the image that I'm working on. This is the reference point. You can enable it by clicking on this icon. If you're in Photoshop, I want to say it's a 20... I don't know, what was it, 2018, 2019, when they removed it by default? So you have to I think it was 2020, it now. wasn't it? They did that. Yeah, it's 2019, 2020, something like that. You um, have to click on this button to enable it. Before, it was on by default. Can you but show, now the have to... button, show the button slowly so people can see where it is? Yeah, yeah it's right on the top left-hand side here in the options bar. 
And what I'm going to do is just move this reference point here. And now when I rotate the image, it'll rotate from that point. See that? And I can also scale from that point like so. And I'm just trying to match the arm as best as I can. It doesn't need to be perfect, but it can be close enough. Then I'll increase the opacity again. Uh, let me just drag this below here, uh, which is going to clip it to the layer below. So control alt G on Windows, command option G on the Mac if you don't know how to do that. And once it's here, uh, once it's clipped to the layer below, it will use the edges of the arm. So I got to rotate it just a little bit more so to make sure that I don't get any of the arms background. And you can see her elbow there, that her elbow really wouldn't be here. It'll probably be lower. So I need to scale it up a little bit more just so that it's in the right area. But the point is, is that I'm trying to just match the arm as best as possible so that it matches the actual um, composite. So something like this. And it requires a little bit of fine tuning, but I think that the results are worth it. Let me just go a bit more like that. I don't want to spend too much time fine tuning this image, but I think you get the idea. So once we get it to about this, this spot, we can actually start working on the blend. And all I'm going to do is desaturate the layer. Control Shift U on Windows, Command Shift U on the Mac to desaturate a layer. Then I'm going to change the blending mode to screen. It's right up here. The screen blending mode keeps bright pixels and it hides black completely. So the brighter a pixel is, the more it will show. The closer it is to black, the less it will show. And what I'm going to do now is go into image adjustment levels. And I'm just going to uh, darken it so that only the brightest pixels are showing. See that? See how now the all I have is the highlight? And see how that highlight is much more realistic than the one I was painting in by hand? So. I can put that in here, create a layer mask, and then I can just start painting away the stuff that you know doesn't work or doesn't belong. And of course, I can continue readjusting this layer to make it fit my composite a little bit better. So that highlight there is going to be much more realistic than anything I could ever paint with a um, just just by using the brush tool. So then all I would need to do at this point is maybe even drag this down below um, all the adjustment layers so that it picks up some of the colors from the adjustment. So see that before and after? See that? And I mean, the detail is just much, much better than just simply painting it in by hand. So that's something that I would recommend that you did. You could always keep fine tuning it by going into image adjustment levels and then just you know making it brighter. See that? See how I'm increasing the highlight there? See that? So I can adjust it any way that I want just so that I can get a much more realistic rim shadow or rim highlight, not a shadow. Let me undo this because I think if I go on, oh, I didn't want to undo that. Um, I wanted to see you uh, show you a final version of this. And I thought I, I had that ready to roll, but I guess I don't. So let me open this up. And I think I have an image here that will show you what it looks like when it's done. And I thought that I did, but I guess I don't. Let me see. It's one of these two. Let me open it up. I hope that I that I do have it. There we go. So that's that's basically doing the same thing that I just did, but stealing different parts of the image. See how I got her face here? That highlight on her face is the same highlight that is found on this side of her face right here. You can see her chin here at the bottom. That's exactly what I used on, let me close this one so it doesn't confuse me anymore, is the same highlight that I use down here. And Very these highlights, yeah, these highlights uh, look a whole lot more realistic than just simply painting them in by hand. So I recommend that you do that. You can go steal pieces from- We have other a question for you uh, from yeah. Photomaker. He goes, if we do frequency separation on skin, should we do it before add any external rim like from another portrait? So, okay, so so the answer to that is um, I would put this a uh, highlight that like if you were doing this same technique, I would do it after any other adjustments that you've made because you're you're adding stuff on top of it. So if you were to add this first and then do frequency separation, that, that could get weird. And also to do frequency se separation, you don't necessarily have to merge the image, but I don't see what the advantage of doing frequency separation after this would would get you. So I would do it. Um, 
Okay. I would do it definitely. Yeah, people are, are really engaged and they're really enjoying this. And we have a, we have another question uh, from David Holtstock, uh, another one of our regulars. And he says, uh, what would happen if luminosity blend mode, would you, would you use luminosity blend mode? In, in this particular technique? Uh, which one are I'm you guessing, asking about there, David? I'm, I'm guessing that's the question. If, if that is the question, it wouldn't necessarily work. Um, I think screen, because uh, think about if you think about it this way, the luminosity blend mode would, would um, as I was explaining earlier, with screen, the darker pixels become less visible and black com becomes completely invisible. And then only the brighter pixels in white is what's shown with the luminosity blending mode, we would still keep the darker pixels. So you would actually see like a, a shadow or something on here. Let me. Yeah, he says yes, me... instead of screen. Yeah. Yeah. So let me see um, right here, rim light. And by the way, here's another another trick for you guys. I have so many um, layers named rim light that I don't know which one it is exactly. <laughs> it's like my um, documents, right? Rim light one, rim light two, three, yeah. four. <laughs> Real final, 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 final rim light. Right. Um, let's see. Yeah, I have so many rim light layers that I'm not exactly sure which is the one that I. Oh, no wonder, because I had well, a, probably because your thumbnails are really big for presentation when you're working and your thumbnails are smaller. It's probably easier no. To I, I was actually doing the right thing earlier. So here's the trick, guys. Um, so when you have the move tool selected, if you right click somewhere on the image, like right here, you'll see all the layers that are beneath that pixel that I clicked on. This is why it's very important to name your layers. So if you click on, in this case, if I click on rim light, it'll select this layer, which I, I had the right layer selected, but there was a, a merge layer on top of everything that was hiding it. So the question was, what if you use luminosity? See with luminosity, how I still keep the black pixels, see that? So it's better to use screen because screen only keeps the bright pixels and it hides the dark ones. So you can create this effect. And as you can see here, in this case, I spend more time fine tuning the the highlight, the um, highlight below her arm here, her face, all this stuff. And actually, let me show you what this looks like without any of that. So you can see the difference. Let me hide all. Yeah, and these David things. said that helps it clears it up for him. Yeah. So let me. Let me make sure I don't hide. Okay, cool. So basically, that was the original image with obviously the adjustment layers making it darker. But this is what it looks like once you start adding all those elements from that other photo. So all these highlights came from this photo. So I just took different pieces uh, from this image, as you saw me do earlier with her arm, so that I could make the image work. And you can take something like this, like even the side of her arm here, and this is like really nice, a really nice highlight, and you can use it for almost anything you want. Um, so the point is that you need to um, think about, you know, like when you're compositing, you know, how can you make it more realistic? Can you paint it? Sure, you can get away with painting it, as you saw earlier in this stream, how I just painted it and look okay. Um, that's better than nothing, certainly, but it's much better if you can get that detail you see on the skin um, than not having it. And obviously once you start blending it and you know applying color and all that, then everything looks much more realistic. Cool. Um, are there any other questions? Um, let me see. Yeah, I don't see any other questions. So awesome, I'll keep, I'll keep going. Um, by the way, I see that only 82 people have hit that like button. So there's 263 watching. That means that like almost 200 people haven't hit that like button. So make sure that you hit it. If I show something that you enjoy, that'll help. Um, that'll help Colin here at Photoshop Cafe and it'll help with the YouTube algorithm. So make sure you hit that thumbs up button and also make sure that you follow Colin at Photoshop Cafe if you haven't already and follow me Photoshop training channel. <laughs> Um, so cool. So that's one technique. And let me close this and we'll go and work on something else. So again, there are no particular order. So oh, this one, uh, yeah. we have another question here. Good question here from Jason Halliday. He goes, how do you guys deal with mental block? Mental block. <laughs> oh man. Uh, that, you know what, man, I'm probably the worst person to ask about that. Cause I feel that I just plow to, through stuff, you know, stuff needs to get done. So I don't know. I, I think, 
I think um, I'm assuming in mental block in the creative sense, right? Like I, I need to create something either for work, for a client or for myself. And I have well, no idea. Sure. I mean, well, well, you and I face it, you know, like let's say it's tutorial time. You know, you've got, you know, you've scheduled a YouTube video because you do your, what days do you normally drop your videos on YouTube? Um, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to say because I'm not going to, I never stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you've got a YouTube video, yeah. you know, so say, because yeah. that's, you know, your creative outlet, you know, mainly right yeah. now. So, so say you're doing that and, and you've got no ideas at all. Like, you know, because it happens to all of us. It happens to me. Like, you know, I've got to do a tutorial. What am I going to do? What, mm -hmm. you know, what do you do? How do you plow through that? Well, see, the thing about... Apart from copying about, my tutorials. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Apart from going into Photoshop Cafe and copying your tutorials, um, the thing about, about tutorials is that it, it we're in some ways we're fortunate that we are solving people's problems and I'm fortunate enough and you are as well that we have people requesting content. So it's not always so difficult. Sometimes it's difficult in the sense that, you know, like this tutorial might take 45 minutes, you know, it requires a lot of preparation. Other times it's difficult because you can't find, um, cause see, I get this a lot. Like people will say things like, well, you use the perfect photo and it works. And I'm like, yeah, of course. Like, I'm trying to teach you something. I wouldn't use a photo where it doesn't work. You know what I mean? It's like if you're learning math and your teacher shows you, like, a very complex math equation, you're probably not going to get it. But if you learn the principles with a simple math equation, you're more likely to do the more complex math later on. So I do spend a lot of time finding, like, the right way or not what I consider to be the most efficient way of teaching something. And that could be where my mental block comes in because like, I know I could do this. Like if I wasn't talking and I was just doing it, I could do it so much fast. I can do it in a minute, but since I have to talk and explain not only why, not only click here, click there, but why I'm clicking here and why I'm clicking in there and not over here, then that's where like the mental block could come in. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's a good, um, you know, I think that's, that's a good insight for, for everybody. Um, you know, because sometimes, you know, we're just doing the work and people see the work and, and they don't really understand the process behind it. You know, like we, we do tutorials or maybe someone's a professional designer and mm -hmm. it's no different, you know, like because, you know, obviously beginning of my career and you too, you know, we were that's what we did for a living. And, you know, someone throws a job at you and, and, and it's got to be yeah. done. There's a deadline. And, you know, it's nice to you know create when you're inspired. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you do your best work when you're inspired, but if you're a professional, I think that's the difference between being a professional and a hobbyist. A hobbyist can do, you know, just as good a work as a professional. Yeah. But they can only do it when they're inspired. When a professional is not inspired, they might not do their best work, but it's still going to be a high level of work and it's still going to be possible as professional. So <laughs> I think, you know, for people to understand it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're a designer, photographer, you're creating tutorials, it's the same work ethic um is being able to knock something out at that professional yeah. level so even when you're not at your best it's still not gonna suck <laughs> right well no no that happens often because you know like whether i'm creating a tutorial or, or i'm compositing something if i'm uninspired i could still do something that's you know above average but I, I, with pressure like i have to do this now client or whatever um is requesting something oh i could do it but it doesn't mean that it's going to be my best work or that you know it's going to be like something amazing and i think that the way that you overcome like you get to that level is just by practicing a lot practicing 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 it's almost like being an athlete like i was an athlete most of my life so like sometimes you just don't feel like performing but since you practice so much you may be able to perform okay in a game maybe not your best game ever but you've had that th those years of training behind you they can help you you know rise up from that rut and then hopefully be inspired at a later time that's awesome all right so sorry guys that we turned this in into into an interview we're going to go back to yeah. jesus and uh yeah. let's get your next take so Actually, I'm going to paste the link in the chat for um, for a YouTube video from Adobe. I actually made the composite that you're looking at now in uh, an Adobe live session. So if you want to see how I created this from scratch, meaning from like from starting from zero, check it out. I was doing this stream with uh, Claudia from Print My Soul on. And she's in here, by the way. Awesome. Hi, Claudia. Good to see you in the chat. And um, but yeah, so we were we were we I worked on this uh, on this composite on Adobe live stream where she was um, my host. 
And yeah, so bookmark that for later if you want. Um, but that's how you can see how I created yeah, everything. Can you send me that link and, uh, I, and I, I can share I pasted, it? I pasted it in the chat. Okay, do you guys see it? Because I don't see it in there. It's It should be one of the, the last comments because I just pasted it. Okay, do you guys see that? And Colin, I could actually, um, if you can't see it, I can se send it to you directly right now. Um, yeah, why don't you do that just in case? Because I um, mean, it might be there, but I'm not seeing it in the um, YouTube. Studio. Right. Well, maybe it's like I don't know. Maybe maybe YouTube thinks I'm spamming you. Um, I just send it to your uh, CS Smith email. Um, but anyway, Thank so you. what I'm gonna do? What I'm gonna do now is um, talk about a little bit about harmonizing an image, like a composite. So in this case, I have this composite here with this uh these background elements and as you can see it's a whole lot of layers that create the you know the background here and i have um the superhero which is this woman who is actually working out but i just made her look like that like a superhero by adding like a jacket to her and these bracelets or armlets, whatever they're called, tattoos, a whole bunch of stuff, right? And then the lightning. So um, basically what I want to show you guys here is that when you have done all this work on top of a composite, sometimes just to take it to that next level, you have to harmonize the entire thing. You have to apply colors or, or whatever it is to make it feel like a cohesive unit. Because sometimes even though you, you do color matching and everything looks great, there's still something missing. So I think that it's always a good idea to end your composites by harmonizing your your entire image there's two ways you can do so you can select all the layers that you have and put that into a smart object if you want if your computer can handle it great sometimes when you put a lot of layers especially if they're large layers or you're working with a large file size that has a lot of layers putting it all into a smart object may slow down your machine and that may not be the best thing for you because now you're, you might be working slow so an alternative to that is make a merge copy of all the layers and you can do so with a keyboard shortcut control alt shift e command option shift e on the mac and that takes um that takes all the layers and puts them into one more so you still have all your editable layers but on the top you have a merge layer so control alt shift e command option shift e on the mac or you can just slam your forehead up against the keyboard and i'm sure you'll get all those keys but the point is that this usually I call this layer final because that's like my final, you know, the, the way it's going to look. And I convert that into a smart object. The reason that I'm converting that into a smart object is because if I later on decide to make an adjustment in the layers below, I need to adjust the top layer, the top smart object with the adjustments that I've applied. So to do that, all I need to do is just double click on this layer thumbnail or smart object thumbnail. It opens up in a new tab and I can replace the content. So when I close it, any adjustment that I apply to this final uh, smart object will automatically update. So what type of adjustments can I do to harmonize this image? Usually I like to apply a camera raw filter and just treat the entire thing as a single image. So to do so, I like to start with the temperature panel. In this case, I would like to add a little bit of blue just to make it more cinematic. See that? See how by cooling the image is just looking a little bit better. Maybe add a little bit more contrast on this image. I think that would make it look good. Maybe darken the shadows a little bit to continue adding more contrast. <clears throat> I can also increase the texture just to make the lightning and the other details in the image pop a little bit. Clarity, which is contrast in the midtones. Um, I can also increase the vibrance, which protects already saturated pixels and skin tones. In other words, it saturates the pixels that are desaturated without blowing up the skin tones too much. Um, let me see. And then I usually like to add a little bit of detail, which is uh, sharpening. So when I sharpen an image, what I like to do is start by adjusting the masking slider. If you don't see the masking slider, just click, click on this little triangle. And the masking slider, when you drag it, you really can't tell what's going on. But what you need to do is hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and then click and drag. And Photoshop will find the edges of the image. Anything that is in white will not have, uh, will be, will, uh, let me rephrase that. Anything that is in black will not have the sharpening effect. And then anything that is in white will have a sharpening effect. So I just really want to sharpen the edges. I don't really want any sharpening in the sky or anything like that. 
so I can bring the masking slider to about here and then just sharpen those edges. Also, when you're viewing the sharpening, make sure that you're at 100%. You can see that Photoshop is actually telling you here that if you're not looking at the image at 100%, the adjustment may be misleading. So you can set it to 100% and you can adjust the sharpening so that you can see what that would look like. And notice that the notice went away once I set that to 100%. You can actually zoom in closer if you want and you can still get a good representation of it. But anything lower than 100% would really be misleading. So um, you can always click on this icon to toggle between the unedited version and the edited version. But see how much the image is just becoming more cohesive. It's just becoming more final by doing these adjustments. Also, you can go into the color mixer and look at the colors that your image has. For example, in this case, I have the lightning. And if I want the lightning to pop out more, I can select the aquas here and I can just make some adjustments. See how I can just make that lightning just pop more. See that? By, By the way, this people loved your alt masking tip. Uh, P. Steelman awesome. Photo Maker. Um, they loved it. They said awesome. it was worth the price of admission right there. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, so now I'm just adjusting these sliders to control the lightning. See that? See how much more the lightning is popping now that I made that adjustment? Also, we have a lot of blues in the image. So if I, I can come in here and sort of, you know, shift it to the purples if I want or more into the cyans, whatever I think looks good. In this case, I really didn't want to do that. But maybe I want to saturate it just a little bit more and maybe bring down the luminance to make it even darker. I can go into the oranges, which is where her skin tones would be. Also, the reds and increase the saturation on both maybe even a little bit on the yellow as well and i can just keep making those adjustments before and after you could also go into the calibration panel and make some adjustments to your primaries for example i can go into the blue primary and make maybe make like an overall shift in the blues here to get it more into this like blue teal cyan look which i i like better i could also increase that saturation actually maybe not maybe just a tad so before and after. And um, for those of you that watch me on YouTube or have been following me for a while, you guys know that I like to finish all my composites by adding just a tiny little bit of grain, usually never above 10. And the reason that I like to do that is because if you blur anything in the image or maybe you have an image, you know, like a stock photo that was had already been blurred or doesn't have a lot of a lot of green. It doesn't feel natural to me. It doesn't feel like an actual photo. It feels very digital, very fake. But just by adding just a tiny little little bit of green, just just enough so that you can see the green. It, in my opinion, it does two things It helps the image look more, quote unquote, realistic because it looks more like film. And also it helps, helps tie in all the different elements that you have. You might have some elements that have green, others that have no green, and then elements that have a little bit of green, maybe a lot. The point is, is that by adding just a little bit of green to your entire image, you help it look more cohesive. And also in a situation like this, where it's more like a movie poster, I like to bring in the uh, reduce the vignette just to darken the edges, as you see here right about there and I can press OK. And you can see that just by making those simple adjustments, I took this flat looking photo or composite and made it a lot more cinematic. It pops more. It actually feels more like a like something that you would see in the cover of a movie poster or maybe like a video game or something like that. And it wasn't that difficult to do. All I really did was just adjust a couple sliders and, and I got this result. So this is something that I like to do with all my composites. Sometimes it's not that extreme. Like in this case, sometimes it's simply just a bit of sharpening, a bit of grain, a bit of a vignette, maybe if that. And and sometimes that's all you require in a more stylized. Jerowen has a question for you. Uh, yeah. Jerowen uh, Van, I, th I think it's Dutch, a Dutch name there. <laughs> I can't pronounce, I apologize. Um, but he's asking about LUTs because um, we just did a tutorial on LUTs a couple of days yeah. ago. Are you, um, do you apply LUTs to these or how about using a LUT on it? It depends, it depends on what I'm doing. Like, for example, I could add a color, color lookup adjustment table. And for this one, maybe I would start with like, I don't know, moon, moonlight or something and then maybe go up and down the, see like that one's kind of cool looking, you know? So like I would just go through these, but the problem with LUTs, at least the ones that are built into Photoshop is that the only ways that you can change them is by changing the blending mode or changing the opacity, which is okay. I mean, for example, let, let's say this one, maybe I'll really like this, but I don't like how the lighting is being affected, but I like the color. I can change the blending mode to color and I have the original lighting with the new color. See that? 
or maybe I really like the the lighting, but I don't, but I like my original color. Well, then I can do that. I can change it to luminosity and it does that same thing or not the same thing. The, the opposite it keeps the new, um, it keeps the new luminosity in the old color. Um, so I don't, I don't use them too much, but sometimes I know that there's something in here that will, you know, make it, give me, give me the look that I want. And, and sometimes that may be enough. Uh, I don't know if you taught how to create a color lookup adjustment layer, but you can create your own. You can add, you can stack up adjustment layers and export them as a lookup adjustment layer. And then you can just, you know, save, save the ones that you like. Maybe if you have a specific look. Yeah, you could show us. I mean, we did that in a previous live from lockdown, but we didn't do that in a tutorial. If you want to show us how to create yeah, a that so Yeah, let me, now I have to think of like something that would look cool. <laughs> Let me see. Okay, here I think I have an idea. So I think I have a, I think I have a, a photo of this that might work for this. I have this lady here in this motorcycle, and I think this will work. So I'm gonna freestyle this. So I don't even know if I remember the steps, but you know that this is this is why I like doing live stuff because I get to, um, you know, do things on the spot, which is a lot more fun. I'm sure Colin can relate to that. It's like um, sports. <laughs> <laughs> it's like sports, right? So I can already tell you this first time is not going to work, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, but basically, you can create um, any adjustment layer that you want. You might as well disregard the layer mask because the LUT will not save a layer mask. So you can just, you don't have to delete it, but I'm deleting it to show you that it's not going to do anything. And the selective color adjustment layer lets you pick different colors in your image or whites, neutrals, and blacks, and you can add or subtract a color to it. And I know that sounds super weird, right? We're adding cyan and subtracting cyan, adding magenta or subtracting magenta, adding yellow or subtracting yellow, and adding black or subtracting black. The easiest one to understand if you don't know Photoshop at all is black. If you go, if you add black, you make the image darker. If you subtract black, you make the image brighter, right? So um, let me let me show you an example of that. If I go, if I select the neutrals, you know, I can make the image darker or brighter, right? That's really easy to understand. But what about things like cyan? Like what does subtracting cyan look like? Well, if you're new to Photoshop, you might want to just create just for fun, a color balance adjustment layer. And Photoshop does a fantastic way of representing the relationship between colors with this adjustment layer. You can see that the opposite of cyan is red. The opposite of magenta is green. The opposite of yellow is blue. So that's the same thing on this adjustment layer. It's just not represented as clearly. So we can add cyan. And if we subtract, we get red, right? And we can do the same thing with magenta. Magenta, and then the other side, we're going to get green. That's right, green. I'm assuming somebody typed green in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> and for yellow... We have yellow, and on the other side, we have, that's right, blue. Um, but anyway, so that's how this adjustment layer works. So I can apply an effect by adding cyan, maybe subtracting the yellow a little bit, you know, maybe making it a little darker like so. I can go into the reds and reduce the cyan because I don't want the reds affecting skin tones and maybe increase the magenta and increase the yellow. So I could also create a levels adjustment layer where I just increase the gamma like this and I also delete that and maybe I'll add a hue and saturation adjustment layer actually you know what never mind I'll add a vibrance adjustment layer and increase the vibrance just to make you know the image pop a little bit more and maybe a tad of such of uh, saturation like so right so I can actually save this as a lookup table adjustment layer by going into file export if I remember correctly a color lookup tables, but it's not going to work. Say Photoshop told me you cannot do that because I don't have a background. So what does that mean? I don't have a background. There's an image here, right? It's right here. What do you mean I don't have a background? Well, it's not actually a background layer, which is what Photoshop wants. So what you need to do is select it and go into the layers panel and select new background from layer. Here, here it is. And notice now that the name changes to background and it has this little lock here. So now when I go into file, export um, color lookup tables and the window up here right here i'll drag it over so you can see it there it is and i'll just call it like uh, i'll give it a name ps cafe uh that's what i'll call it photoshop cafe and i can just export you know my lookup table adjustments to find that easy i'll just export it in the desktop there it is desktop so now 
I could, you know, delete these adjustment layers because, you know, we don't need them anymore and it's been a couple of weeks or whatever. And I want to apply that same look onto this image. What you can do is go into color lookup adjustment layers and then load a LUT. And here it is. And there it is. It applies exactly the same effect in one adjustment layer. So that's how you can save a lookup table, a lookup table adjustment layer and reuse it. To be frank with you, the only reason I would do this is if I wanted to use the same look on a video. So maybe in this photo shoot, I was shooting the model and then there's also some video footage and I wanted something similar that just matches. I will probably maybe try this so that I could just drop a, a, a lookup table on like Premiere or After Effects or something like that. But if I wanted to actually save this, I wouldn't I wouldn't do it this way. The way that I would do it is I will take my adjustment layers like so, put them into a group and I'll, I would call them PS Cafe. Uh, actually, you use capital letters, Colin. Uh, look, and I will call it PS Cafe. Look, then I will go into my libraries panel and then let me just find the library panel uh, libraries that I don't have a lot of stuff in. Um, let me see. Uh, I think um, I don't know. I don't know which one doesn't have a lot of stuff. <laughs> this one called test. I have no idea what's in here. All right, great. There's not a lot of stuff. So I, I would take that folder and just drop it in here, right? In that group. And there it is. Photoshop Cafe look. And that is beneficial because if I wanted to apply that to any other image, it doesn't matter the image, I could just drag it in there, but it's not going to work. I've been saying that a lot. It's not going to work right when you first do it. Because if I click and drag it in there, look what happens. It's, it's this weird smart object with a cloud on it. It's not doing anything. If you want it to work, what you need to do is hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and drag it into your Layers panel. And look at this. All the layers are there. And you can continue adjusting the layers so that it works for your image. So let me show you how this will work in another image. So if I go back and just type the word man, and I think I might have a photo that of like a man uh, that might work. I don't know which one would be good. I don't know. We'll just try this one. I have no idea if it's going to work or not. But there's our photo. There he is. And if I go back into my test folder and look for the PS Cafe look and drag it in there and drop it, you can see how that is applied to this image. And if I think that something is not right, I can come in here and still make adjustments to the image so that it works and it looks good with this particular image. So you can save a lookup table if you like, or you can just save the whole thing as a group, drop it into your um, libraries um, panel. And that to me is a more efficient way to work because it becomes more editable. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing the uh, how to make a lot. I think you guys found that very useful. Awesome. And yeah, let us know if you have any any questions. I know I went a little fast there. This is recorded. You can always go back and watch it. And I'm glad to see that people did click on that like button. It's at 175 now. <laughs> so that's great. Thank All you right. so much. 25 more guys um, to get to 200. We've got 259 there. So don't be shy. Hit that thumbs yeah. up button. <laughs> how about this, Colin? How, how about this? So this stream is scheduled to be done in 13 minutes, correct? Something like that, yeah. All right, cool. So if we get it to, say, 225 likes, we'll stay an extra, what, 15, 20 minutes and keep showing more Photoshop tips and tricks? Oh, you're bribing, bribing your run. All right, I like bribes. Yeah. All right, there we go, guys. No, it's not a bribe. It's, I'm, I'm incentivizing Incentive, people. incentive. <laughs> there you go, incentive. So you're being yeah. incentivized. If, if yeah. you... um. But what if everyone just signs off? <laughs> All right, everybody. So you hear that? Let's see. We're going to get some extra tips out of Jesus. Oh, it's a 195. How many do we need? 225. 50 more. Or no, not 50. A lot less than 50. Yeah. We need what? Uh, what is that? 29. 198. Oh, wait, what did I say? 198. Yeah, we there need, we go. We need 220s. We need... Oh, 200. So 20 All right, more. cool. So if it gets right. to... Two, we'll say 225, and then I'll stay an extra 15, 20 minutes. How about that? All right. Pay him in likes. All right, cool. Cool, yeah, pay me in likes. <laughs> um, cool. So now we're going to do something that always talks about it. And this is going to be, I, I don't, man, I, I don't want to complain. <laughs> but since this is a live stream, I get to be a little more 
uh, lose than, an, 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 uh, than a tutorial. So, uh, Colin, I'm sure you get this a lot. When you do a tutorial on masking, people usually tell you, well, why do you, don't you do it on a busy background? Like, why do you have to use, like, a flat surface? And my answer is, well, that's how professionals usually do it. Of course, there's times where you need to work with the images that your art director, your boss, or your client gives you, and it is what it is. That's what we have to work with. But the example that I always give is kind of like a movie director. Like, you've never seen like a tutorial like on after effects you know saying hey why did you use a green screen how come you just didn't shoot it without a green screen it's way easier with a green screen well because yeah it's way easier with a green screen that's how it should be done um so that's why in tutorials you never really see like busy backgrounds and but i do realize that that's a need uh in some cases so this is what i'm gonna show you now how to what to do when you're dealing with flyaway hair like she has there on a busy background because again i realize that it's a need but it's always not the ideal situation so this is not the ideal situation but i'm going to show you at least one technique that you can use so that you can make this work so we have a background and we just want to place her in there and we can of course use the quick actions and click on remove background and see what that does and it does a fairly good job i mean the new ai is is not terrible see that i mean th that was a really difficult background and it did a good job in my opinion so we can work with this we can work with this you can always go back in there and select the layer mask and go into the properties panel and click on selected mask and you could also make adjustments right so by default you're going to go into the onion skinning mode if you have something else selected photoshop will remember but the first time that you go in here you'll see the onion skinning mode and basically when you're 100 percent you'll see the masked version and as you reduce the transparency you see more of the original background in this case i don't really need to see the original background all i need to do is smooth the edges and i like to do this in two steps not one and if you watch my youtube channel you guys know that i always recommend people doing a two-step method for this not one and i'll show you why i think it's easier if i go into the black and white mode to show you why i want to smooth the edges of of her body first right but when i do that watch what happens to her hair right? It doesn't look good. And if I increase the contrast, it doesn't look good. And the contrast is allows me to have sharper edges where I need them, but it completely destroys the hair. So what I recommend people to do is just forget about the hair, do the person or the other element and worry about the details later and just press OK. Then you can go back into the selected mask workspace and the sliders are all reset to zero. And now I can work on the hair and I can just click on refine hair and Photoshop will look at the hair and refine it. See that? See how I just refined it? And just to let you guys know, what's going on here is I'll go back into the onion skinning mode and select show edge. You see this show edge? This is basically where Photoshop is looking to create the refinement. And notice how it got part of her body. It got her face and all of that. So you really don't want that. So you can just subtract it with the refine edge brush tool, you can subtract that. See, that's how I'm subtracting it. And basically what this refine hair feature is doing, it's basically doing an automated paintbrush stroke with the refine edge tool. So notice that I have the brush, the refine edge brush tool selected. If I enable this plus and paint, Photoshop now is looking at that edge. See that show edge, see that? So that that's all this, this button is doing. It's just painting it um, by, uh, automatically for you so you can actually just you know cancel out of it if you want and then go back in there and i still have the same show edge enabled but let me go into the onion skinning view show edge and notice that there's nothing there right because there's no edge there but if i go into edge detection i can increase the radius and see that photoshop is now making those refinement adjustments just on these edges but usually i don't like to do that uh just to show you what this is um this is the radius of 52 pixels around the edges of your image and Photoshop is using the algorithm to detect the edge and also remove the background from the foreground. You can also use smart radius and Photoshop will try to not make it a 52 width stroke around the image. It tries to guess, you know, how big or small the edge should be not being larger than 52 pixels, however. Um, but anyway, I don't like to do any of that because I think it's better if you just do it by hand. So what I like to do is I like to just select the refine edge and just start painting like so. And I can select where Photoshop is going to make those edge refinements. See that? And when I click on show edge, you see that? It's exactly what I painted on. And, you know, in some cases, refine edge, the automatic uh, AI 
feature it may do a good job in other cases it doesn't so it's totally up to the image that you're working on and i don't really want it to look at her face because we're definitely going to keep her face so something like this but anyway once that happens photoshop is doing that refinement and the composite looks okay and i'll press okay and this is looking good but it's not looking great there's a lot of you know hair strands missing and what i like to do in this case is paint them in you can paint them, paint them in in one of two ways you can literally take your wacom tablet or whatever graphics tablet you have and just start painting hair strands and that could look okay and that could take a while what i like to do is um just take hair from somewhere else and then use that to make a brush let me show you what i mean i know i have um a photo of a lady here that we can use to create a brush. Let me just scroll down until I find it. And we will create the brush. And I hope I can find her quickly. Oh, there she is, her right here. So you can take a, a photo like this and you can just crop it like so, something like this so that we just have that hair. And I can go into the channels panel. We just need to make it black and white, right? So the hair needs to be black and the background needs to be white. I can take the blue channel and click and drag it into the new channel icon to duplicate it. You never want to work on the actual channel because you will destroy the image. In this case, it's not important that we destroy the image, but still we want to we want to um, not destroy the image. So now to make the background white and the foreground black, there's so many things you could do. You can go into image apply image that means that photoshop will take um one of the channels or one of the layers and then apply a blending mode to it and then put it on top multiply makes things darker and screen makes things brighter so i think i'll go with screen just so that i can get the white the the background as close to white as possible so see that before and after actually you know what i changed my mind i'm gonna go with multiply yeah, I'll go with multiply. And then I can do, use something like image adjustment levels to brighten the background like so. And I can just keep adjusting it accordingly. The point is, is that I'm trying to get as much of the hair strands as possible while keeping the background black, I'm um, sorry, white. I can select the dodge tool, the dodge tool. I'm going to set the range to highlight so that it only affects the brightest pixels. And I'm going to keep a, I'm going to keep a low exposure so that I could just paint in these areas. And I just want to keep the, the background as white as possible. There we go. I think I think this will work. Then I can just um, create, uh, I'm going to have to invert it now. So I'm going to just press Control I, Command I to invert um, because I want the, actually, you know what? Now that I inverted it, I need to make some of these areas darker just so that the hair strands come through better something like this anyway then i'll hold control and windows command on the mac click on the blue channel copy go into rgb go back into a layers panel and then just make a black solid fill like that and it's really not that important that these other pixels here are transparent i'm mainly concerned about the hair strands if you made something that is not completely black you can always go back into image adjustment levels and just brighten the pixels now brightening brightening will make them darker now because we're dealing with a layer mask now so basically the opposite of we were doing what we were doing a moment ago but you can see how i'm really starting to get that hair and that's going to look really really good so what i'm going to do now is go into edit um let me try that again. Go into edit, define brush preset. The reason that that didn't work earlier is because I had the layer mask selected. The focus, the white outline wasn't the layer mask. I needed that on the actual layer. I can go into define brush preset and I can call this uh, hair brush. There it is, press okay. Now when I go into this image, watch what happens when I create a new layer and I just click and paint. See that? That's the hair. So I can select a color that is similar to her hair, like so. Reduce the brush size by tapping on the left bracket key on the keyboard. And that's how you know you've been using Photoshop for a long time because the new cool people use the other keyboard shortcut with the uh, on-screen overlay. But us old, older people <laughs> use the uh, bracket keys. But anyway, talking about uh, keyboard shortcuts, there's a new keyboard shortcut, um, which is the right and left arrow keys to rotate the hair. But when you click, that's what you get. And basically, 
what you can do at this point hey, is uh, yeah. I'm gonna ask you a quick question, um, and this will be an opportunity for you um, to go relieve your bladder. Not you, but <laughs> some people in the in the chat there are braiding their legs. They said um, so they, they they don't want to miss a thing. So you're too engaging. Um, but we had a great question there. Only only on a live stream can we say this. Um, let me go back here. We have a great question, and then we and then I want you to continue that. Um, and then that just gives because the poor guy's bursting. Um, okay, so Photo Maker was asking the question: to make that hair sample darker or lighter, you know, to make a brush, can we use the brush on overlay and paint on the background or hair with black? Yeah, you can. You can definitely do that. That's one of the techniques that um, that you could do. Um, I mean, oh man, did I close that file? Um, I think I already made it too too perfect for that to to work. But let me see if I could. Get it. So, so basically, the question is, can you? So, the answer to the question is yes. That's the simple answer to the question. So, you can select a, like a soft brush like that, and you can, um, you know, select something like this and change the brush's blending mode to like overlay. And then when you, well, actually, that's actually way too strong. I would need to reduce the opacity, but you can reduce, you know, and just paint and then kind of get in between the, the, um, you know, darker areas like so. You see that how I'm just selecting the the hair strands are at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I could have done that as well. I didn't think it was necessary, but you can definitely do that. You can also switch it to white and it kind of does the same thing the other way around, how it just um, makes those hair strands come out even more. So in this case, actually making the hair strands pop a little more is, is, is actually doing a good job. But the answer to that question is yes, you can change the, over, the blending mode to overlay on the brush, not the layer. In this case, you can't do it because it's a, a channel and then paint with black or white to enhance either black or white on the image. That's awesome. People are loving it, by the way. Um, people cool. are having a great time. So please can continue. Awesome. Yeah, so let me go back to that brush that I just had here. I think it's this one. And I'll just select the color that is... Oh, one thing I was going to mention is um, if you open up the brushes panel, you can flip the x-axis. And then when you paint, now the hair is looking the other way. But now I need to change my mode to normal and increase the opacity to 100. And when I paint, there it is. I actually want the hair to be a little blonder. So I'll select a different strand like so. That's looking really good. So I can just now use the bracket keys to kind of like size up her hair and then rotate it like so using the arrow keys on the keyboard. If you're in an older version of Photoshop, using the left and right arrow keys in the keyboard will not work. You will have to come into the brush settings and rotate this icon here so to rotate the brush but basically what you want to do now is just click once like so and place this behind her and what that allows you to do is create these hair strands see that see how i'm creating these hair strands and i'm going to go quickly here using different layers but i think that it'll be obvious what i'm doing um i'll rotate it a little bit more and then just try to get more more hair on here see that see how i'm getting her hair and basically what I will need to do at this point now is just make sure that the hair is the right darkness. I think it's not dark enough for the composite. So I can go into image adjustment levels and maybe darken it up a little bit so that it it looks more like the hair that's actually there. See that? Or maybe even brightening it up. But you get the idea. See, that's how I'm getting these hair strands now. So that looks a lot more realistic than me just painting over the, the actual image. I can go back into the layer mask here. And just with a regular brush... I could paint with black and just hide all these areas that are just really blurry and just let that brush, that custom brush that I created just do the magic. See that? Just keep painting. And obviously I need to do a little more work on top here. I wasn't very, very good on, on the top here, but you know, I think that you get the idea. And that's the thing about, about, you know, the techniques that Colin shows or me or anybody else is that a lot of times you may know the techniques, but the real magic happens when you start fine tuning things and you start really spending the hours in there. But you can I think you get the idea of, of you know, how, how this could work. And actually, I'm not liking that one so much. So I can just hide the ones that I don't like and just keep the ones that I like. And there it is. See that? See how that hair is there? And it just looks much, much better. And also keep using different um, hair colors. Don't use the same one. If you use the same one then it looks more unrealistic, but you know, you can select something that's darker and then paint with that and see what that looks like, put it below everything else. And then, you know, just, just see, see what works for your image and just move it around accordingly. 
and you'll get really, really good hair strands. So that's that's one of the tricks that I would use to. Um, let so me just duplicate this. Tracy this one says and, another fabulous t tip, and uh, Orca, uh, sorry, uh, Russ from England uh, from London says brilliant tip. Thanks, Jesus. Thank you so much, everybody. So they're lo loving these uh, these tips, and we have two more likes to get to. 220. So come on, guys. If you have not hit that like no, button. No, 225. 225. <laughs> 225. All right. Keeps going up. It's like uh, Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. But it doesn't always go up. But hopefully the likes don't drop like Bitcoin does. Um, <laughs> all right, yeah. guys. So, oh, 222. Look at that. Oh, Boom. there we go. All right. Overachievers. There we I go. All right. 223. Yeah. Two more, guys. Two more. Um, and then we get an extra 15 minutes. 228. Okay, I think I think we can save. Oh, two twenty eight. We're past there. All right, we we're got past it. it. All right, All right, so now, man, now I have to stay here longer with you, Colin. <laughs> no, oh, just kidding. No, that could be could be worse things, you know. Yeah, but anyway, you can as you can see, you know, you can start moving these hair strands around and just making it, you know, match the composite as best as you can, and that's much easier, much more realistic than trying to to select something that's so difficult to select like her hair up against that original background as you can see she's blonde and there's all kinds of stuff going on in the background so yeah that's that's one of the things that i would recommend all right that's great cool. okay so we're at past 230 likes so we're ready for another tip all right let's go um okay well i'm done guys so it's, no just kidding so um this is an, uh, a tip about making um, a, an image match into a composite. Like a lot of times when you put something in, you know, it looks fine, but you really can't tell what's going on. So one of the tricks that I like using is making a solid color fill layer, setting it to, it doesn't have to be 50%. You can just be off, you know, I'm at 53 here and that's fine. As long as the saturation is down to zero, it doesn't matter. Press OK and change the blending mode to luminosity. And what that's going to do is that this is going to like essentially crush all the luminosity down to the luminosity of this adjustment layer and you can actually see the hues of the image and if i increase the hue and saturation you can see all the colors that are found in the image but see that see how one of the reasons that this is not looking as as, as good is because there's a difference between the the um, foreground and background and to make it even more obvious because actually i don't think this is it, I'm gonna make a uh, like a fake adjustment here. Like, let's pretend that this is what the original image looked like, just to make it even more obvious. So, if I go into selective color and select neutrals and just bump up the you know uh, blue and all these different colors, I think that that'll make it more obvious. And I'll merge these two so that we know we're you know like let's say our original image is that right, and you're placing this object in here. When you do that color check layer that I just showed you, you'll see how there's all these different blues in the image that are not found in the foreground element. So that's why when you composite, sometimes things don't look right because there's these little subtle colors in the background that might not be easy to see. And if they're not in the foreground, then it clearly looks like the foreground element is not part of that background. So by creating a solid color fill layer, setting it to something like 50% or, or, you know, in this case, 53, that's fine as long as saturation is set to zero. And then creating a hue and saturation adjustment layer and bumping it up to 100%, you can create this check layer that shows you really what kind of colors you have in the background. And what I'm really looking at is not so much at the green of the trees or any of that. I'm looking at the street, all these things that have gray that should be quote unquote a neutral gray to try to see what color cast that image has. And notice that his suit it should be technically white, but there's actually quite a bit of yellow in there. The street should be gray, but there's actually a bit of blue in there. So what you can do is either adjust the background or foreground totally up to you. In this case, I'll adjust the foreground element. I'll select the selected color adjustment layer and clip it to the layer below. With the neutral select that I can start adding a little bit of cyan just to try to bring in some blue, re reduce the yellow to bring in a little bit of blue. And notice now that just by making that simple adjustment, the foreground element is kind of looking a lot like the background or the, the environment that it's in. And when I disable this, that just looks a more, much more better than that. And I know it's a subtle adjustment. You can barely even see it. See that before and after, but these are those little subtle details that make your composite look more realistic and less fake because now you're taking into account the ambient color, the color that's in the background. Also, if I really wanted to match this and make it look more 
accurate to the scene, the model here is way, way brighter and has less contrast than the background. The background has more contrast and it's darker. If you can't see that, one of the ways that you can visualize that is by creating a black and white adjustment layer. So you can remove the color and just notice how much more he pops. And it's okay if the, the main figure in your scene pops. That's actually a good thing. But in this case, I think he's popping too much and the contrast is not right. So let me work on the contrast. Um, so I'll select the layer and then create a levels adjustment layer. I use the levels a lot, uh, adjustment layer often. It's super easy to use. Um, so I recommend that you use it. So what I want to do here is I want to click and drag this over to the right, the dark pixels, because I want to make the darker pixels on this foreground match the darker pixels on the background. Also notice that the background really doesn't have anything that's pure white. The, everything here is super, super white. So I can click and drag this one to the left just to darken the whites a little bit. And I can just make adjustments until I get something that looks like it belongs in this particular scene so that it matches. And then when I disable the black and white adjustment layer, you should have something that matches better before and after. See that? So this is without the adjustments. This is by taking into account luminosity or brightness, I should say. It might be too, too much, actually. So let me reduce it down a bit. And then this is by applying that color effect. And maybe just for the purposes of stylizing the image, I can increase the yellow, decrease the yellow more and increase the cyan just a little more. So just because um, things look okay in the check layer doesn't mean that you can't change them afterwards to look better in the actual in the actual scene. So you see that just by making these simple adjustments, we were able to make this model fit this scene much, much better. Nice. That's very, that's very good. People are loving that. Um... I think Photo Maker said here, I was sampling a color from the background and adding a color fill layer and reducing the opacity. This makes much more sense. Awesome, Tracy yeah. said, this is great. I struggle with this. Um, David also, says the black and white adjustment layer is so useful for this just as a check layer. Yeah, people are loving it. So also something you guys gotta have to keep in mind, not all saturation, these saturations are the same, right? So let me show you what I mean by that. So let me go in here and, you know, you know, I get lost now that they, Adobe changed all these, you know, that we get all these presets and I, I you can tell I've been messing with them because I have them like duplicated like three times and I can't even figure out where anything is now. But anyway, here, here, here we go. You, you and me both. Uh, so you know what I do have... though is uh, if you go, go back in there, I, I got a tip for you. I got a tip for you. Go back to your um, gradients, your, just show all the gradients. You know what I do is at the very top, see though, just, I grab the old ones, like grab the, you know, the foreground, background, whatever ones, uh -huh. and I yeah. drag them above the groups. So the mm. basic ones are always at the top. And I yeah, the but, but look, at, look at what I did here. For some reason, I don't know what I was doing and I just kept duplicating Syncing, them. <laughs> sync presets. Yeah. I, yeah. I wiped out all the presets on all my machines from sync presets. Yeah. So be yeah. careful, guys, if you use that. <laughs> back yeah. them up before you do it because uh, you can get some unpredictable results anyway definitely please, please so continue. so we are talking about that not all saturation is the same right so let me just duplicate this in case that way i don't want to we have to redo it but um so you know how do you desaturate a layer well one way is by going into hue and saturation and desaturate and that's the result you get right and then another way is by going into vibrance and reducing the saturation same same name right saturation slider and Look, look at what happens. Completely different result. Do you guys know why that is? Colin, do you know why that is? And let me just do one more. Like, I can even do a black and white um, adjustment, and we're going to get a different result. So just because you're desaturating or removing the color in, a, in, in Photoshop, you're not going to get the same result. No, but it, almost every method gives you a different result. And the reason is the math behind all these different things. And... If you notice, the hue and saturation adjustment layer uses the HSL, L, very important, lightness, color mode. That's not the same as the HSB color mode. See that? So this, these are two different color modes, HSB and HSL. Um, a lot of people use the word brightness and lightness or luminosity interchangeably. I've probably done it a bunch of times, but they're technically not the same thing. So that's why when you desaturate a layer, you get different results depending on the method that you use. The HSL method is probably like the most 
um, scientific or robotic way of looking at it. And when, what I mean by that is when you um, look at an image, ba basically what this is doing is it's taking the, the, the brightness level and the saturation down and giving you a resulting gray base on the math, basing on what the brightness value was of, of this particular color. So when I enable this, you can see that when I, how can I do this? I can, here we go. When I click and drag on here, you'll see that the hue is the only thing that changes, but the saturation and brightness does not. So when you desaturate with the human saturation adjustment layer, basically you're just removing the saturation entirely and the hue doesn't matter. And then you're just left with the brightness, right? And that's why you get a solid flat color because in the eyes of, of math, it's the same number. It makes perfect sense. But with a vibrance adjustment layer, you don't get the same thing. You get these darker areas and these brighter areas and in different shades. Why is that? Well, it uses a different color mode. This one uses the HSV color mode. And this one is designed to be more like the human eye. Um, to us humans, certain colors may look darker than others, even though the numerical value might be the same. So in this case, to everybody, blue will look darker than yellow. And I don't know if that's true for everybody. I got to be sure I, because it might be different for colorblind people. So I'm not sure if that's a, true or not. But um, it's definitely true if you have normal uh, vision that blue will look darker than yellow. It just is the way that we perceive color. So this is why this adjustment layer uses um, color in this different mode. So whenever you're desaturating, uh, desaturating layers, keep in mind these differences because that will affect the result and that may affect how you edit your, your image or the, the look that you're going for. So I most of the times will use the black and white adjustment layer because this is similar to the vibrance adjustment layer, but notice that by default, it already made some adjustments. So, you know, um, it's not 100% the same, but it's, it's close enough and it's easier to make than making a vibrance adjustment layer. So that's why I use that particular one instead of the hue and saturation adjustment layer. That was great. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, well, we're, we're at 2.15, so I think we're at a pretty good spot here where... Well, let um, me do one more, one more, one more. Okay, all right. Go ahead. Let, let us know in the chat if you want one more, because we did get to 240, so that was way past the the goal of 225. So let us know if you guys want one last one. It just takes a second for it to go through, because there's yeah. a little delay here, but I'm sure they do. I still wonder if there's a way of identifying what would be color equivalents of grayscale images so we can use the correct colors to recolor the grayscale one. Any ideas? Oh, from oh no. If I understood the question correctly, is like, can you determine the color that something was was by based on the grayscale? If if that was that was the way I read that, how did you read that, Colin? If there's a way of identifying what would be color equivalents in a grayscale image, so we can use the correct colors to recolor the grayscale. I think I kind of like what you showed because uh, you know because we were looking at I guess it's the perceptual versus the uh, is, that, is that what they call it for the colors um, mm -hmm. perceptual versus relative or whatever it is. I yeah. forget the correct yeah. names. Um, I mean, there is, you know, like you can sample and just look at the, uh, the brightness value when you sample it is one mm -hmm. way. Um, so I think that's probably what he was asking. I'm going to imagine. All right, cool. So we have one more and thank you all for the 241 likes. Uh, and the okay. One so David, David just cleared that up. Sorry. Sorry to be, he says, so he can recolor a, a, a yeah. picture. Yeah. Well, there's no real way because you don't know if, if the photo was manipulated in any way, as far as I know. Colin, I don't know if you have any any different answer than that. Um, you know, colorizing a photo is a whole thing. Maybe David, maybe we'll look at that um, in a future mm -hmm. LFL. We'll address coloring a photo. How's that sound? Right, right. Because that's that's a discussion all in itself. Cool. Um, and also, I'm I'm pretty uh, shout outs to Matt Kleskowski. I'm sure that's the only dislike we got on this stream. Thank you, Matt, for the dislike. I'm just joking. Matt, Matt Kleskowski's <laughs> in the house key? No, no, he's not, but I'm sure he came in just to dislike this video. Oh, of course he did. Of course he did, yeah. <laughs> and by the way, Matt's a, a good friend of ours. That's why we're messing with him. So big shout outs to Matt. I'm sure he's the only one that dislikes my videos. Well, maybe he's <laughs> under here under a different name. Oh, yeah. He's he's known for having fake accounts. That's right. Yeah, and disliking yeah. everybody's videos. That's right. Um, so one more. <laughs> um, so here's a composite. Um, 
And one of the biggest issues that I see with a lot of people is how do they how they remove fringing or edge halos when you max mask something. So see that, see how this is a shot in original, the original background was white, but then we have like this halo around there. There's actually a tool that I don't see a lot of people using that I think works great. If you have a layer mask selected, there's actually a filter that's designed specifically for masks. So if you go into um, filter, other, we have the maximum and minimum filters. They work the same way. One increases a mask, the other one decreases it. So if I go into minimum, you can see that this slider will decrease the, will contract the mask. And the algorithm is actually really, really good. You can decide to preserve roundness or squaredness. I prefer roundness for two reasons. Number one is we're, when working with organic objects like a person, it keeps the roundness better. I guess that's why they call the name, but also, Notice that roundness also gives you decimal points, so you can um, adjust. In uh, you don't, you're not stuck with just whole numbers. So what you can do is just maybe increase this slider accordingly, just to, you know, reduce it so that the um, the uh, fringing goes away. And obviously, you, you will have to experiment with that and see what works best for the image that you have. Also, another advantage of using this technique, and I'll undo this. The other advantage is that sometimes you may have a great, great selection, but maybe only one part requires that. So just like with any other filter, you can make a selection and then go into filter, other, minimum, and just work on that area without destroying the rest of the mask. See that? So I think this is a really, really powerful way of just removing fringing from images. Uh, the question often comes up is, isn't that the same thing as either going into select modify and contract when you have a, a selection active? So the answer is no. It's not the same thing for two reasons. Number one is contract only the select contract option only works with a selection, not a layer mask. And also number two is you only can work in whole numbers. So you can't use decimal sum point. So those are the two reasons why they're different. And the other question is, well, what about the uh, shift edge on the select and mask workspace, that's sort of the same thing. But notice that even at negative 100, see negative 100 here? Look at how I didn't really remove the fringing. See that? See how it's still there and the edges are really jagged. And I would have to start smoothing the selection and maybe adding a bit of contrast and doing so much work. And I still don't get something that that removes that fringing entirely and it doesn't look as good. So completely different algorithm. It works great. I highly recommend that you use it either on a whole photo or just on a little piece that requires that mask contraction. And also just to show you guys, this filter also can expand the mask. So you can go to filter, other, maximum. And now I can just create, it's essentially creating a stroke, but it's, it's really part of the mask. See that? And look at how good the algorithm is. See how it keeps the edges really, really nice. It keeps those little bumps. So it creates that effect you see there. So highly recommend that you use this filter when you're trying to remove halos or outlines from your photos. So people loved that tip. Like, yes, excellent tip again. Great tip, best tip today. Um, and then Rob Barry, of course, is not satisfied. He wants one more. And then there's people asking, we've had several people asking, how do you blend images and collages? How to blend image? I mean, that's a whole nother stream, but um, I guess the best thing that I can tell you about blending images and, and collages is, well, how about this? We'll do one more, Colin. I don't have to go, but we'll do one more. This is, this is about blending images, right? So I'm going to disregard the collages part because the collage in my, at, at least how I understand that word, it's almost like when you're a kid and you're cutting photos and collaging them, you know, like when you're in high school and putting pictures of your friends or whatever, it really doesn't, doesn't matter how you collage them as long as it looks good to you. But when you're blending images from this, different sources to create a composite, like make it seem like the person is there, then it matters a lot. And one of the things that matters the most is perspective. We can spend all day talking about perspective, but the one thing that you have to keep in mind is there's a surface and there's a person or object standing in that surface. If you want to make it seem realistic, then you have to keep perspective in mind. So you have to look at the image and figure out a couple of things. I, in my head, it's really easy to think about it these days is where does the ground plane meet the sky? Because and no matter what image you're looking at, if you have a, a ground plane, usually the floor or the street or whatever it is, there's usually a person standing in, in there and on there, and then there's converging parallel lines and they always end up at the horizon line, which is 
uh, at a vanishing point, which is at the horizon line. And the horizon is always where the ground plane meets the sky. It just it is what it is. And if you've studied uh, perspective drawing, that's what it is. And if you are like a 3D artist, then you understand that as well. In a photo, you have to find um, all the leading lines. So you see how these lines right here on the side of the street and the railing lead to like right about her hip. So that's where, where the vanishing point is. That's where the horizon line is. Um, if you, um, another way to think about it is like the horizon line is always at eye level, right? But what does that mean on a photo? Where, where, where was the camera in relationship to height and tilt when the photo was shot? So in this case, I can imagine a photographer maybe stand, uh, maybe like kneeling, like they're on their knees maybe, or on one knee, and they're just taking a photo looking up a little bit. So then you could you could make the argument that the hor her horizon line is like right here on her hips, and it can't be much higher or much lower than that. And if we look at this image, we follow all the parallel converging lines, you'll end up like right about here. And if you imagine this image without any buildings or, or uh, anything else, you, you probably can assume that the horizon line or where the ground plane meets the sky will be right about here. You don't have to be perfect. It, you, you can be close enough, right about here. So then if I wanted to composite her in, in here and let her be in perspective, then I will need to place her somewhere around this range. You don't have to be perfect, but the closer you are, the better it'll, it'll look. So right about here, uh, she would look good. So I can click on the remove background button to remove the background. And, you know, she looks like she's she's there. Obviously I have to work a little bit with the shadows and color matching and all that other stuff that I did earlier. But the most important thing is perspective because if I place her like right up here, she doesn't look like she belongs. The perspective doesn't match. If I put her down here, it doesn't work either. Only when I place her more or less in perspective is when the image starts looking uh, starts looking better. So I hope that um, I hope that uh, what what happens when there's no um, visible horizon? Well, you have to imagine it, right? So like, for example, let me. I think I may have an image here that might help me illustrate it. Um, give me one second. Okay, so like right here, right? We don't, this is the same image of that woman in that superhero thing. We don't have a horizon line, right? Let's just assume that she's jumping in the air, so it doesn't matter, but let's just assume that she was standing on the ground. So she's not, she's not floating or anything. She's like under tippy toe. Um, where do you think the photographer was when the photo was shot? Was he, was he kneeling, standing? Where was the camera tilting? Just by looking at it, I think, um, that the photographer was, uh, you know, his eye level was maybe like right about here will be my guess, somewhere around there. And there's a couple context clues, right? So if you're looking at, um, I'm trying to see if I have something here, like on, I don't know, my phone, for example, right? If I'm, if I'm right at, at eye level, I cannot see the bottom or the top part of the phone. If the fo phone is below my eye level, that means the horizon line is here and I can see the top of the phone. If the phone is above my eye level, then I can see the bottom of the phone. So I'm actually using like imagining her thigh like as a, a cube, like a, like a, you know, like a rectangle cube type of thing. So I can't see the bottom of her leg. So then that does, that means that, you know, the horror, I mean, I can barely see the bottom, but I can definitely see the top. You know what I mean? So I'm imagining that I'm imagining that if, if her waist, uh, if she was invisible and I can see the waist of her pants, I would still be able to see the top part of the pants. So then that means the horizon line is on top of that. You know, so I'm just imagining like, what can I see? She's leaning forward a little bit, which is why I can see her shoulders. So maybe I don't think the horizon line is this high up. I think it's right about here. So I'm just have, thinking about all these context clues in my image to try to figure out where the horizon line is is in an, in an image that doesn't have any parallel leading lines. But I can definitely tell you one thing we can rule that the horizon line is not up here. So, you know, like this is probably like my my no man's land, like right up here, there's nothing there. And it's probably not down here either, right? So when I composite, I know that the horizon line that I placed her in needs to be somewhere in here. And that will make the composite sort of realistic. Ideally, I could really figure it out and see where it is. Also, here's another tip. Um, think about when you're shooting, think about a, a photo with your phone or with a camera, right? I'll use the phone since I have that here. If you're shooting straight on, right, uh, straight, straight forward, the horizon line would be right about the center of the image. But if you tilt your camera down, 
Now the horizon line will be above the center of the image. If you tilt your camera up, the horizon line will be below the center of the image. So these are all the little context clues that you need to look at when you're looking at a photo to determine where the horizon line is. I hope that answered the question. I know it's a little long-winded, but I felt that I needed to, to mention all those things. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, that's very useful. You know, these things are, you know, sometimes you realize it, but you know, sometimes you need someone to explain it to you for you to actually, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense. You know, I've seen that, but until someone explains it to you, you don't necessarily understand, you know, right. what, what you're, what you're looking at, or you just haven't, yeah. um, you know, like people are like, okay, yeah, that makes sense, you know, cause I'm looking at, you know, I'm walking and I'm seeing the tops of things and bottoms of things. And then uh, it all kind of comes together. And I think that helps. And, you know, definitely, you know, people are thanking, yeah. loving these tips. You know, people are just and and loving. by the way, I think that Matt heard us calling him out because I don't see that one dislike anymore. Oh, he took it. <laughs> he took it away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, now I'm com now I'm convinced it was Matt Kuskowski. Uh, must have been. If not, it was uh, Glenn Lewis. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Glenn Lewis or Matt are always this like in our videos, guys. Oh, that, that's Lewis. not how you say his name. You know, it's Glenn Jewis. You know, this the Dewey, British. The it, British Jewis. Jewis is how the British pronounce it. No, but it. his. But I think like his real pronunciation from like I don't know where the name originates. I think he said it was Dewey or something like that. No, 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 no. Because I said it once. I said uh, okay. Glenn, Glenn Dewis, and he actually said um, I was the first one in America to say his name right. All right, all right. Do you guys know well, Glenn? You, by the way, Are you guys know yeah. who we're talking about. These are yeah, friends of ours. Um, yeah, check out Glenn Dewis. Also, Glenn Dewis. Um, his book, his Photoshop book, is. I mean, I know you have like thirty something books, Colin, but. No, uh, Glenn, I need 20. Come on, man. Uh, only 20. There you yeah. go. Uh, but Glenn uh, Dewis is just, uh, I just saw that he posted on his on his Facebook page that he's got a uh, a Photoshop book coming out. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. From Rocky, with Rocky Nook. Is it Rocky Photoshop? Nook. What was it? Photoshop it's a, it's layers a masking, or something? No, it's a masking. Um, Photoshop masking or something. Uh, let me see if I can find it so we can share it. Masking. Uh, let me see. I should probably just go on his Facebook because I know that that. Okay, just... so Kathy Kathy says I said his name right because she knows him. Oh, okay. All right, Great. so I feel like I've accomplished something, uh, fellow Brit, as you said, Colin. All right, I well, feel like well, 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 people don't know Colin where you where you were born though. I think I think that's why you know how to say it. Well, actually, they do. I think. Oh, they know. They know. Where was Colin born? Let us know in the chat if you know where he was born. Okay, that, that's good. Yeah, let's find out. Let's find out. Okay, so here we go. So this is um, I'm gonna paste the link in the chat, and I guess I'll show it now while people are typing that up. But this is a uh, Glenn Dewis's new book. It'll be uh out the 17th of August of this year, and it's a Photoshop layers and selections book. And he always does some fantastic stuff. So check out Glenn and his book, and I'll paste the link in the chat. Oh, Chris and Tracy got it right. They said oh, Scotland. So Scotland. You wow, you got some real fans there. Auckland, then New Zealand. Uh, That's right. Wow. Uh, under under a bush, <laughs> under a bush in Scotland. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Scotland, under a bush in Scotland. New Zealand. All right, you guys got it right. Yeah. Well yeah. Done. So well so done. you're 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 a Kiwi via Scotland. Oh, how, how is that saying? Uh, you're a Kiwi way of Scotland or something like that. I don't know the saying. I don't know sayings, guys. I don't know why I'm trying to say. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that sounds good. Uh, a Scotland, beyond the wall. Zealand, yeah. Beyond, the, beyond wall. the wall. Yeah. From the frozen north. Yeah. 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 But then I moved to the sunny south, which yeah. trust me, parts of New Zealand are very, very chilly too. Um, nice. So anyway, that was that was good. All right. Yeah. So um, we went an extra thirty minutes. Thank you for the two hundred and fifty likes. Look at that, two fifty likes and zero dislike. Uh, thanks again, Matt, for don't worry, don't worry. We'll get the likes. dislikes on the replay. Yeah, we'll get the dislikes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Scottish right, Kiwi. Everybody. There we go, Jason. You're right. So well, thank you. I want to thank you, Jesus, for. Um, joining us uh, two weeks in a row um <laughs> uh, last week you guys couldn't hear him because i had to figure out the audio turned out i had to install an audio driver but you don't care about that uh but you know hey thanks for giving up um, your afternoon and um you know you're probably starving for lunch now i'd buy you lunch well i'll buy you lunch next time I hey see man you, 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 could, you could you could always uber me something I can Uber you some lunch. <laughs> you know what? I'll send an Uber from here. And, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be from there. your house. You'll, you'll make me a sandwich to get the guy to pick it up. and then Yeah, just write it be the world's most expensive sandwich. But it, um, it, it, It's only like a, a short six and a half hour drive to your house, Colin. Yeah, you, you know, I could put it in a Tesla and just yeah. kind of send it there and autopilot. Yeah, and, there you, you know, go. Might not make it, but... <laughs> 
Yeah. Actually, the battery it would it would probably die halfway there. DoorDash. So there we go. DoorDash. There we go. DoorDash. That's right. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It was awesome being here. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you guys again soon. And keep enjoying the um, live from lockdown. I guess this is week forty six, Colin. This is week forty six. Yep. My God, that's amazing. Excellent, man. Good yeah. job. So that and the crazy thing is, you know, we had a few weeks off for um max and christmas uh you know different times like that holidays so mm -hmm. um guys we've been in lockdown we've been doing this for a year um that's right so i want to i want to thank you guys you know especially you know a lot of you have been here every single week you've never missed a week which is just absolutely incredible a lot of you have missed a couple but most of you are here every time uh thanks guys for you know for doing that and you know the reason we're doing this is you know because we're not selling anything we're not you yeah know, we're, this is we're not doing this for that we're doing this because this we're is doing this for community. likes okay <laughs> <laughs> well we do want likes we beg for likes but yeah we were know, begging for likes but this this is about community and it's about all of us coming together and um you know and just you know sometimes you know one of the things that unites us all is art and we have a yeah. passion for art and Photoshop, and it's great that we can come here. And Colin, put us side by side, man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on a sec. I'm really good at. There we go. Now we're talking. Oh, by the way, I went to headphones. Um, my AirPods died. Um, oh no. In the middle of it, so um, yeah, I switched to headphones. But anyway, so yeah, no. But this is why we do this, and Cr um, you know, as long as. Cr you Craig guys. is asking, are you going to be around after a lockdown? Definitely not. Colin's going to go party hard as soon as the, <laughs> I mean, I think Colin must have moved to Texas now that they opened up completely. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Um, yes, I did say that um, we've actually had that question a few times after lockdown. What's going to happen to life from lockdown? Is it going to end or, or, or what's going to happen? Um, we're still going to continue to do something. You know, obviously, it's not going to be called Live from Lockdown once we're not locked down. Um, It'll be Live from Not Lockdown or Unlocked. <laughs> It'll be Unlocked. You can just call unlocked. it that. Just unlocked. Photoshop, yeah. Photoshop Cafe Unlocked. There you yeah, go. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. So, um, yeah, we're going to do something. Um, I, I have pledged that. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, you know, it might not be weekly. It might be. But we'll figure all that when we get to it because... Right now, you know, the advantages, you know, people like Jesus and I, we're, we're home. Um, Jesus, you know, bounces around, I guess, to UK every now and then. But, um, you know, whereas in normal times, you know, we are traveling a lot. You know, you and I, I can take my glasses off. I don't have to read. Um, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we do conferences and stuff together all the time. So, you know, mm -hmm. obviously we're not going to be able to do it every week because, you know, I'm going to be traveling and doing things. But we're definitely you know going to do something. You know what's your? I haven't seen you in over a year, and I used to see you more often than friends that live literally ten minutes away from me. <laughs> uh, same here, same here. Yeah, we used to see each other on the road all the time. Yeah, um, once every couple of months at least. Oh, at least, like sometimes we see each other every week. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that comment. It says "life after lockdown." Life uh, after lockdown. Jerome. Life after Jerome. lockdown. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry if I mis mispronounced your name, but that was that's a, that's a good. Oh, comment. I like that. You know why? Because I wouldn't have to change the logo that much. That makes yeah. it even better. You know. Yeah, I, yeah. I could keep that. Oh, oh, yeah. Life. The little e and the oh, I could keep that key. I, did you guys notice the key in the logo? Um, I don't know if you did, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I never actually. It's that's animated in the intro. You know, I didn't run the intro this week. No worries, man. No intro needed. Yeah. Yeah. No intro needed. So. That's um, right. So anyway, guys, uh, thanks for coming. I think we're going to let you resume your normal lives. Um, everything will be restored to normal um, until next week. Yep. We're going to see you for another wonderful episode of Live from Lockdown. Now, by the way, uh, Jesus, tell everyone where they can find you. Uh, Photoshop Training Channel is a YouTube channel. Um, subscribe and TikTok, Instagram, JR from PTC. Um, I do one minute tutorials on TikTok. You're doing them as well, Colin. So if you if you guys want to see some short form Photoshop tutorials, TikTok, uh, Colin, you're at Photoshop Cafe, I'm guessing, and I'm at JR from PTC. That's that's right. And you can find him at JR PTC on uh, Twitter 
and other YouTube, uh, not other YouTube, yeah. other social media. So, <laughs> hey, Zeus yeah. is very active on Instagram. Uh, actually, are you actually, yeah, a little bit. No, I'm, I'm, but I was mostly more TikTok, on TikTok, TikTok, yeah. TikTok, and um, Twitter. And I'm, I, and I'm not doing any dances, by the way. Just, just saying. <laughs> Thank God for that. That's why you have subscribers. How many subscribers do you have now on, um, on uh, TikTok? Um, You're, he's a big TikToker. I don't know, but it's somewhere around half a million, like 400 and something thousand. All right. Jason Halliday is one of them. All right. Awesome. All right, All right well, guys. Thanks. So we're going we're gonna to so check everybody. out of here. Um, don't forget, subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet um, to where you are here. Just hit the subscribe button. Also go to the Photoshop training channel. I've dropped the link in there. Maybe I'll drop it in here again. Um, go there and there's a link. And subscribe to Jesus for some great uh, Photoshop tutorials as well. And uh, we'll see you guys. See you next week. Later, everybody. Thank you. Bye.